Welcome to the Talking Transformation podcast, presented to you from Cape Town here in the Western Cape, South Africa. The podcast is presented with a view to providing a platform and voice for built environment professionals and interest groups who are working towards transforming the places and spaces here in South Africa. It's dedicated to the individuals and community groups who are supporting both the formal and informal processes that are shaping our cities and our spaces. In today's first of four deep dive episodes here in the Talking Transformation podcast, we introduce the concept and ambition of the road to net zero carbon buildings here in South Africa. We're joined by four representatives from the metropolitan cities that have signed up to the C40 Climate Leadership Group and specifically the Global Net Zero Carbon Buildings Declaration in 2018. This commitment sets the ambitious target of committing the signatory cities to powering new buildings with renewable energy by 2030 and retrofitting all existing buildings by 2050. It's part of the national global commitments made to limiting global temperatures to 1.5 degrees Celsius. It was a commitment secured at the Paris Climate Agreement. That you'd remember is the one that the United States of America has been part of, pulled out of, and are back again with the Biden administration. So it's that agreement that we're talking about. In South Africa, the built environment accounts for nearly 40% of all emissions in our cities. And if cities do nothing, we estimate that emissions from the built environment sector would double by 2040. So today we're asking the question of why and how the program fits into the municipal plans and national regulations. And what does net zero carbon mean for the cities that are impacted? This is new for South African cities and what do the cities have to do to move from their current status quo to this ambitious target of net zero carbon buildings? To help us understand that in this introductory episode we have Liana Stradham from the city of Johannesburg, Leslie Sabanda from the city of Cape Town, Kedebone Modesele from the city of Tswane and Nondemiso Mtumbu from Etikweni Municipality We also have the benefits of Sustainable Energy Africa's Megan Houston-Brown and Tlangiwe Radebe, who we introduced in our bulletin episode introducing this deep dive series. And we asked the big question, can we rise to this challenge? We hope you'll enjoy the episode and join us on this journey over the next coming few episodes of the Talking Transformation podcast. So it's just gone 5.30 on Tuesday afternoon here in Cape Town, and I'm joined across the country by colleagues who are working with C40's uh, Cities Initiative, working with Sustainable Energy Africa in trying to work towards this idea of global net zero carbon buildings uh, by 2030 and 2050 in terms of existing and new buildings. We're gonna be discussing this as the first part of our four part in-depth deep dive. And let's just take a quick roll call of who's where in Cape Town. We've got Amal Sali from the Talking Transformation podcast, myself, Megan and Tlengiwe, who were all part of the introductory bulletin that we had just over two weeks ago. How's everybody keeping this this afternoon? Megan, you well? I'm well, Pete. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Tlengiwe, all good your side? I'm good, thank you. And Amal, how's things your side? You keeping well? Really good, thank you. Fantastic. Now, the the anomaly of today's guests uh, is that we have our representative of Cape Town, Leslie Sabanda. Leslie, I think you're up in Johannesburg today. You're up in a big city today. How's things going your side? Hi, Pete. Yes, I'm in Johannesburg. It's going great. And thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. It's great to have you with us. Looking forward to hearing the Cape Town perspective. Uh, in Johannesburg, residing in Tswane, but working uh, there by Johannesburg, we have Liana Stradham. Liana, how are you keeping? How's the good people of the city of Johannesburg today? Hi, Pete and everyone. It's actually great in Joburg, and it's a pleasure to have our Cape Townians visiting. Um, usually it's the <laughs> other way around. <laughs> so welcome, Leslie. Also in the city of Tswane, Kedeboni, Modesele. Kedeboni, how are you keeping? Are you well today? How's the good people of Tswane? Hi, Pete. All is well in the in, in Tswane and it's great to be here with you today. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. And fi- last, but certainly not uh, not least, we have Nondemiso Mtembo at Etikweni, there by Derbs. How's things your side? All good down in KZN today? Everything is awesome, Pete. Thank you for leaving the best for last. <laughs> I'm feeling a bit left out because everyone is up in Gauteng and I'm in KZN. But anyway, that, that's where I am in the cool place where we got the beautiful breeze. 
Really, colleagues, it's an absolute privilege and pleasure to host the, the four cities here uh, this afternoon. This certainly seems to me to be a very big deal. It takes us back to the agreements there that were signed off both uh, internationally and commitments made by the national government uh, back in Paris. I think it was 2015. And this is certainly a program that tries to take one sector and look at the whole question of climate change and adaptability at scale. And I'm going to come to you first, Leslie. Uh, you know, what is what is this all about? How big a deal is it? And how do you think we're starting off in terms of uh, almost a, a state of readiness of, of the cities? You're representing Cape Town, but the, let's, let's start, start with a sort of national perspective. Are we ready for this? And how big a deal do you think this is for our built environment sector? Is it a big deal? Yes, I think it is for numerous reasons. Firstly, I think whilst all the individual cities have been working, you know, in terms of climate change mitigation, it's the first time that a program like this has happened in South Africa, where four major uh, metros are actually working together and not in competition, but rather are working collaboratively towards one goal. And that goal is of a net zero carbon built environment. The collaborations between the, the, the four c- cities is quite a first for South Africa. And so we're all working collectively to drive change change in individual building development, but then also looking at precinct development and driving change in urban planning. So that's quite a big deal, I would say. If you look at even all the cities, and I'll speak for the for, for, for city of Cape Town, we've been in this journey for over 20 years where we've been tackling climate change challenges in order for us to build a more resilient and sustainable Cape Town. But through the involvement of the program, um, we're ramping up the change. And so we're realizing that the ambitions that we had, the targets that we had set are not enough. And so this is being bold in leadership and stepping out and saying, as Cape Town, in conjunction with City of Johannesburg, Eteguini Municipality and City of Swane, we're going to become leaders within the space. And what we're doing in terms of the built environment is not enough. So we need to go over and above that. And hence, we've committed to these ambitious uh, commitments of net zero carbon buildings by 2030. Through this, we effectively committing to ensuring more energy efficient buildings, but we're making sure that our buildings are buildings that are healthier spaces for people to live in, but we're also reducing our carbon emissions and ensuring you know, we have a more resilient, resource efficient and equitable cities in South Africa. We've ramped up the ambition in line also with what's happening uh, on a global scale. Like, as you mentioned, we've aligned ourselves with the Paris Agreement. So trying to make sure that all the changes that we're making in that in the built sector provide you know the emission reductions that we need for us to be uh, to 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 become on the low carbon trajectory if i understand correctly this is a, a, C, a cities or c40 initiative i mean megan can you just remind us what 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 that is about and how the, this program came to be uh, initiated it is a global program i think that's an important thing to to remember is that correct Yes, so so Pete, the the four big metros, and recently and very excitingly joined by Kuruleni, so they're five now in South Africa, are all members of the global C40 cities movement. And it's really a a movement of the biggest cities in the world and trying to sign up to a very ambitious climate response program. And C40 has a a sort of a headquarters in London and a a kind of an executive arm, and they've been funding this program. So firstly, they they work at the political level and geared the mayors up to to support this kind of ambitious action. But then they followed it through with funding and appointed ourselves, Sustainable Energy Africa, as the the local implementing partner to support the cities to, to really affect this. And, and what catalyzed this? Uh, Liana, let's take Johannesburg as an example. Uh, did your mayor go out and sign a declaration and come back and ask officials to make it happen? This is an excellent example of where politics and city administration professionals, we are actually all on the same page. So as much as this particular program was launched by the then mayor, Herman Mashaba, in 2016, when he signed the commitment towards the net zero carbon buildings program, I think we all started much earlier than that. And Johannesburg especially has a long history with C40 membership. We joined in 2006. And I think there's been really great progress made in the city 
with regards to commitments to various programs. And in terms of the city's own growth and development strategies and, and planning and environmental frameworks, you see strong sentiments being expressed about a low carbon based economy and a city transitioning towards resilience. And this has been under the leadership of more than one mayor, more than one political party, and it's become quite institutionalized in the workings and the thinking of the city. The buildings program, however, has been catalyzed onto an accelerated track, because I think besides the fact that it was signed, the agreement was signed in 2016, the matter of the fact remains that there is such an urgency to not just create a program for the South African cities, but to really accelerate implementation, to be able to deliver at all on the 2030 commitments that we have made. So I think what's really interesting is that the city is very much aware of the, the commitments it's made, the, the tall order, the fact that it's very much not just about the regulatory framework that we need to create. In fact, it's much more about the partnerships, which, which touches a bit on how the city launched this program into the space of policy making and possibly moving into the space of formulating new bylaws. The, the first principle was start the conversations and identify key stakeholders, not just in the city, but also other partners. There's such a, a range of key role players in the built environment sector that you have to involve, that's absolutely critical to work with this transformational program. And we have really as program and as individual cities launched a variety of conversations and engagements and collaborations to help us start building this overall transformation that would be required. It sounds like it's, you know, it's quite a complex undertaking and in its ambitious spirit, maybe we can talk about where one even starts with this. So perhaps we can talk about um, like the policy and the bylaw kind of starting point for this project, Kedi Bonne. I think the starting point really for this is starting with evidence. Uh, you start with evidence in terms of making sure we understand where we are as cities. For example, through the greenhouse gas inventory, we have seen that the, those environments emit a lot of carbon emissions and uh, in terms of the way they operate. Most of the cities that are here, or all the cities that are here, have all done their greenhouse gas emission inventory, which showed that uh, we need to, to, to have some policies and strategies in place to mitigate against the, the emissions that are coming from the, the built environment. So I think that it was the, the main starting point. Just to also check what's happening in the, in the national landscape in terms of built environment. Of course, we need to work with national to make sure that whatever we are implementing or we are coming up with aligns very well with uh, national regulations. With the current green building bylaw for the city of Swan, which is existing, uh, we needed to, to, to check what are the implementation gaps that are, are currently existing. And uh, what we found was that uh, there were implementation challenges and enforcement of the current green building uh, bylaw and policy. So we had to now check what is it that we can do to make sure that when we review this green building uh, bylaw for, 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 for making sure we achieve net zero, what is it that we need to address first so that we make sure that implementation happens? And uh, yeah, so that's where we, we have been able to start. So far, um, I think in terms of the work that has been done, uh, especially with, with the four cities working together, there has been quite an advanced work that has been done to make sure that there is that integration and alignment between both local and, and national government. Kedeboni, you're mentioning national government and the municipalities and the importance of those working together. I'm guessing there are other partners who that 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 you'd be working with. And and just to try and clarify in my mind, you know, what is it that you're asking of the sector, the building sector in those people who at the moment would be, uh, you know, taking a lot of strain because of the, the COVID pandemic and looking to, you know, keep costs down, try and, try and keep the pipeline of projects moving. We know we're in a technical recession and so forth. These are some of the challenges, I guess. So on the one hand, what are we asking of the sector in the short term? And who are the partners, uh, non-demiso, that you are working on to help you uh, and help the cities reach these uh, very uh, ambitious targets? 
Um, thank you. Funny enough, you, you, you bring about um, COVID because I've been telling my colleagues for the longest time that we, it, it's business unusual. We live in an era where it demands change. We need to change the way we act. We need to change the way we think. We need to change the way we behave. Basically, in the medical field, in the times of COVID, we, we are labeling it a new normal. So we're asking businesses to, to, to come aboard with the new normal and start building green. That will not only enable us to have beautiful structures and assets in our cities, but it will also enable our kids to have a future because the moment we, we, we stop building green, we are killing the very environment that we are living in. So if, even if you look currently, if they just look at the building, um, national building regulations, they only look at the building before, uh, during it, it, its built uh, period. Whereas we're looking at the operational side of the building and the operational side, it, life cycle of the building is much longer than the project life cycle of building the, the building. So we're saying, let's not focus on the short term. Let's focus on the long term because it has long term uh, implications for us. Etegweni residents, South Africans, Africans within the continent, and globally as citizens of the world. So that's what we're asking for. We've partnered with a number of partners. Uh, we've got SIA, who's helping us with technical work. We've partnered with Green Building Council South Africa. We've partnered with SALGA, who's enabling us to find a way and how do we then draft our policy so that it does not become does not conflict with other policies that are out there a lot of people listening would be familiar with the green the green building council the green star system and so forth but in terms of pulling them in how how are they directly either assisting or contributing to to this work and an aspiration so currently in south africa we don't have any specific guidelines on green buildings the Green Building Council is the only body that we have that has such guidelines. So currently we rely on them to give us some form of direction on what needs to be done. For Etegwini, we've relied predominantly on them to guide us on our policy development on what, what, what is a green building, what is a net, uh, a net carbon zero building. What is a net positive building? So all of those definitions that come into play in our policy, we get all those definitions from them because we don't want to be saying something and then a different organization is saying something else, but we're all within the same industry, so to say. So we, we, we're really working close with them so that we are all on the same page and, and we all understand each other. If I could just add to that, because I think it's quite important to also make the distinction between the, the, the sort of green certification process, which currently South Africa has a, a very good green building sector. But what the cities are trying to implement here is a, a kind of a market scale transformation where every building will need to be compliant with the, the new bylaw. That will be not something they have to get a kind of a, a green building certificate from uh, uh, for and uh, pay for that, but really something that is actually part of the requirements for building in the city. And, you know, it, it covers almost every single building in the city um, and it's not a nice to have anymore. It will be a, a requirement. What the cities have, have looked at is a pathway that that starts by kind of driving efficiency deeper into the buildings. And then, as Nondemiso mentioned, it's not just about the, the base build, but in fact, making sure that the building through its operational life is as efficient as possible and that whatever energy it does need, it will be ultimately met by renewable energy. But it is a phased approach. So we're not hitting people overnight with, OK, you know, tomorrow you must do this. It'll, it'll sort of get phased in. The first phase will build on the the National Regulatory Foundation, our national energy efficiency requirements. And once that's really being well implemented, then um, it'll start to ask cities, uh, uh, developers to go deeper. And then only by 2030 are they looking at making the renewable energy component a, a requirement. So there's time. And I think all the cities would agree that they've been, you know, very much in, engaging with and hoping that the sector will engage with them around, you know, how to make this happen. Picking up on what we spoke about, you know, this can't really happen in a siloed way and there needs to be a multiple partners. In Joburg, 
um, you engaged with the financial sector as you developed the policies. And Liana, maybe you could walk us through what some of the responses from the sector were like. I think it's always absolutely critical and very interesting to engage with the financial sector because the first answer that any developer or the city for that matter will, will give you is, well, does this thing pay for itself? What's the financial feasibility? How are we going to finance it? It's a, it's a critical aspect. As the city of Joburg had more than one engagement with representatives of the financial sector, I just want to refer to almost a first informal discussion we had with a, a grouping. What was interesting is most of the, the commercial banks were expressing a, a sense that there is a transitioning happening that the pace is increasing slightly, that the financial sector is seeing the strategic growth opportunities in the green development. But still, there are many critical questions that, that needs to be answered, challenges regarding the cost of capital. Although there may be a lot of climate funding available internationally, or the perception is that there actually are quite good funding streams, it's difficult to access for commercial banks. And I think, as Megan said, the main point of this process that the cities have embarked on is an in-depth market transformation, which means that you would actually need to really involve the, the commercial lenders as much, as much as other investment companies and, and other service providers. One of the things that the program embarked on was to continue having discussions with financial sector led by some very capable private sector practitioners who is trying to identify some of the key challenges in the finance sector. Some of these aspects will be explored later in, in episode three. So I'm really hoping you will stay with us and listen to the next delivery. Key points that were made linked to things like there's still a mismatch between the economic and the financial feasibility, which will have to be bridged. And that can only mean further collaboration between public and private sector. The answers seem to lie within a space of blended finance solutions, at least at the start of this program. And public sector will obviously have to assist, ensuring that there are more opportunities for this blended finance options to, to take place. And the point remains, if there's not a high quality and widely available market information that can really work with so many sharing the lessons about financial feasibility, business cases, not just with the niche markets, the SIPOAs and the SANT and CIDs that's actually leaders in the space, the developers that's already using the green building rating certification processes, but to actually make this work for the whole range of affordable housing, for example, then if we cannot get that transformation on the financial sector to play a more direct role, we will actually continue to struggle with some of the financing aspects. Kedabone, the what is the reaction from the building sector been? We've had very stringent and long processes in terms of stakeholder engagement, where we had focused uh, discussions and we had uh, the building sector or the, the property developers uh, being part of the discussions and giving input into what the, the city is doing. And what we could sense is that actually the, the, the building sector has been ready uh, because if you can look at the, the trajectory, especially looking at one in terms of the upcoming green buildings that are, that are going on, are being constructed, the sector was actually looking for an enabling environment for this to happen. So they wanted a government to be on board. And this was the perfect timing uh, for us to, to, to be involved in this process and to make sure that we support what the private sector or the property developers is, uh, are doing. So this was um, actually received uh, very well. One of the key things I think that we, we, we discussed also as a separate engagement uh, or a grouping was to discuss with the industry in terms of how we can make sure that you know the, the implementation is as, as smooth as possible to make sure that that implementation is done by the building sector or the building industry. So there were quite a lot of uh, inputs in terms of, uh, especially when it comes to incentives, which is something I think uh, we'll talk about later on in or in other ep uh, episodes. 
incentives were also were the main uh, part of, of the buy-in that uh, uh, developers were also looking at to say, what is it at the city of Swane that we'll be providing in terms of these incentives and how then will we make it easier for developers to make sure that they develop according to what the city of Swane would want to see on the ground. I, I have to also mention that that discussion about incentives is still going on because we believe it's something that we need to perfect and make sure that both parties from the city and the, and the developers and the community at large are able and are receptive of what we are proposing. And also making sure that whether it's a financial or non-financial incentive, it enables this process to, you know, to unfold as successfully as possible. So it has been quite a good progress that we've made with the with the private sector and the property developers so far. Thanks, Kelly Borne. Appreciate that feedback. And Nondamiso, have you had a similar experience there in Etiquini? Yeah, definitely. Um, as Kiriwani had alluded to, the private sector was almost waiting for something like this to happen. They've already started building green in Etegwini as well, and all they needed was a platform that will enable them to do so. So they've received us very well from the beginning of the program. What we did even before we started drafting the policy, we engaged with the private developers and the private sectors, and we went with the management frame that we don't want to leave anyone behind. So we tried to include as many people as possible to input before we even started drafting the policy so that they understand what is the program all about? What is a net carbon zero? How does it impact us? What is climate change? And surprisingly enough, everyone knew about it and they were just excited and couldn't wait for the policy to come out. So when the policy eventually came out, we got very positive feedback from them. In fact, some of the people who actually um, had responses, had um, a couple of things that they thought was important to be included. And currently we, we're looking through those responses and we're taking in all the responses they take, uh, they've take they given us. One of the things that they've also highlighted here in Etegwini is the whole incentive thing. Luckily for us, our, our revenue department has said, no, it's okay, they're going to give non-financial incentives, but that will be covered in the later series as to how that will go, because we are still in the development uh, stages of the incentive policy as well. You know, you spoke about the reception and the reception has largely been quite positive, but I think when projects are ambitious to this kind of magnitude, there is going to be some pushback. So um, maybe, Megan, you could talk about some of you know, the, the other responses on the other side. I think that, um, as Kedi and Nondamis have said, the balance of uh, re- response has been incredibly positive. But just interestingly, there were from, from some of the sort of big uh, engineering companies, there was a kind of reaction of, my goodness, but this is... This is sort of more ambitious than London, which I think is something we should all be aspiring to be, is more ambitious than London. After all, I think Kimberley had electric streetlights before London, so there's there's no reason we can't be ahead of London. But but I think it is important to note that it is ambitious and it does require sort of new approaches to design. And one of those is this huge reduction in heating, ventilation and cooling. So it, it, it is quite a radical change. And there is a wonderful guide that's been developed by the South African chapter of ASHRAE, the Heating, Ventilation and Cooling uh, Organization, Association, uh, along with the Green Building Council and ourselves, that gives a, a lovely overview about sort of how to achieve this. So it is very doable. But people can be a little shocked at first. But I think what Nondamisa said about people actively contributing you know, additional elements they wanted to see in the bylaws definitely gives the major feeling of openness to this, yes. Leslie, I think you, you personally were involved in drafting some of the first, so let's call it templates and policy around this. Can you sort of give us some of the ideas of what framed that, that thinking and how you were able to start to put stitch together the elements and the, the variables that go into such a, a sort of complicated policy with such bold ambition? I won't lie, like that was quite a daunting task that I was given with that drafting of that first policy. As an engineer by training, I never thought I would end up working in like policy and regulation development. So when I was given that task, I was a bit overwhelmed, but it was also an exciting opportunity. The draft was informed by various things. Firstly, we we looked at our global best practice, tried to see what had been done in other cities 
and we looked at the cities that had done it and asked ourselves what had been successful in there and what hadn't worked and why it hadn't worked. And then we tried to see the bits that worked, how those could be localized and contextualized for South Africa. The draft was also informed by a number of legal frameworks from a national, provincial, and local level as well. So we looked at the legislation that tries to address climate change, environmental sustainability, natural resources, and and infrastructure. By doing this, we wanted to make sure that we align as much as possible with national policy. And then we also looked at city policies, strategies, and bylaws, and we tried to make sure that we align that. It was quite good in that our legislation is progressing towards, you know, like like our national development plan is already envisioning building regulations that stipulate that buildings are net zero carbon by 2030. So there was quite a good alignment with what was already in national policy and strategies. Um, we also looked at the city of Tswane's green building bylaw that provided quite a lot of information. So we tried to understand what they had done, the process that it they had gone through with their initial green building bylaw and the lessons learned and we incorporated it as well. But it was also very important for us to look at doing something that's very sim- simplified and streamlined. And so we decided to use the current SANS 10400 Part XA, which are the energy efficiency regulations as a basis of the pathway that we developed um, to net zero carbon. And then lastly, it was also influenced by what's happening in the broader green building industry within South Africa and also globally. And we tried to see how we could leverage off the work that the GBCSA had already started to do. Um, So we work quite closely with the Green Building Council and other green building practitioners within South Africa to come up with this with this um with this first initial draft it's evolved since then but um these are the things that informed the first thinking uh, uh, around that in our discussions and our marketing of these podcasts we've talked about the idea of a pathway a roadmap the idea of being able to measure our uh, achievements as we go forward between these four cities maybe liana can you give us a bit more of a sense of you know what is that roadmap what are the components of it Peter, I think it's a critical part of this whole endeavor to understand the transformation as a pathway. And if you wish, it is an aspiring one. So (laughs) imagine a bit of a gradient. It's we are we are climbing the small Everest. That is an international shared experience. We have approached the policy formulation and the targets we're setting to improve the overall energy intensity usage to actually incrementally improve over time. There's more than one reason for that. So the the main drift of it is that for for the period between when the policies would come into effect, which would probably be towards 2021, early 2022, depending on the timelines of the cities, for the first couple of years until 2025, our pathway has a strong correlation with the national pathway that's related to the new SANS XA regulations. That is already um, quite a jump, quite an improvement in overall energy use intensities. For some categories of buildings, it would definitely take a rethink of what they are currently doing. If you also add to that the fact that we want people to start thinking through not just the design aspects, and Kiriboni touched on that, but also the operational aspects, Again, it's quite a rethink. You actually have to think who your end users are, who you are designing for, how you're going to communicate the operational requirements of those buildings to your tenants, to the next owners and occupants. And from a city side, how do you also monitor the actual improvements and the energy use intensities over time? So after 2025, we are aspiring to introducing the the renewable energy side. Of course, you may do it before that, but what we are trying to entrench is that people understand that you can actually achieve so much more if you design better from the start. And the renewable energy aspect will will help us to achieve so much more and ultimately to achieve the net zero. But I think critical to this whole endeavor is that we take stock of how we progress. Um, It's critical to see in two years time, in three years time, definitely in five years time, 
before the renewable requirements kick in. Are we ready? Has the institutions adapted enough internally, our processes, our capacitation of our own professional staff, as much as the built sector out there and the professional capacitation that's, that's part of this process? Any one of these pathways require the ability to adapt and maybe reconfigure, repurpose some of our approaches and strengthen some of the areas that we may be lagging behind on as an overall built environment sector, not, not just as, as city administrations. So Megan, I mean, in terms of a road, a road map, uh, a pathway, I, I assume there will be certain markers, there'll be certain uh, monitoring and evaluation techniques, things might be written into performance contracts, there may be uh, ways to monitor things from the systems, the building systems and so forth. How, how are these things being thought about uh, in, in this whole process? You know, something really worth saying is that our national energy efficiency standards have been in place since 2011, and and really they started to get implemented in around 2012. And because we don't have a way to monitor it, there is no data collected on that. We can't actually work out how well we've done. And as an organization, we did a indicative model, and we worked out that just those national uh, efficiency building requirements had saved something like, or shaved off something like 30% of the emissions that would have gone up into the atmosphere if they hadn't been implemented. You know, that kind of feedback loop is so critical and we really hope to get that in place. We have to start getting a a kind of an energy use intensity figure onto our building plan approvals. So it's a sort of a, a data element that needs to be there. Why that's so keen is not just for monitoring, but in fact, the the financial sector have said they need that information. They need that data in order to bring down their lending rates. Uh, You know, if they can start showing that greener buildings sell faster or sell at higher prices or or, are more desirable in the market, they can change their finances. So it's it's really exciting. But then there's also the the ongoing life cycle of the building that needs to be monitored. And um, in discussion, in fact, with an institute in America, they came up with something they're piloting there, and I think we could do it here, which is, um, you know, the same way that we report to SARS, for instance, if you're a member of Discovery Health, you get a kind of an annual certificate. Um, So there's some possibility of of getting the development themselves, you know, the, the users and owners and occupiers of the buildings to report on an annual basis on their consumption. And, and hopefully the electricity utility will issue a certificate which says, this is what you consumed this year. This much of it was carbon intensive and this much of it was renewable. And, and we'll actually be introducing mechanisms of reporting on carbon. And It will be for this program initially and the the kind of energy performance certificates that national government has just regulated on. But, you know, it's a system, I think, that will need to expand uh, with the carbon tax. um, And, you know, hopefully we can create systems in this program that will be there for the new world we're stepping into, which is a world that needs to be uh, able to see what's happening on on the carbon front. At the moment, we're looking at the the building in terms of its its operation, but the cities are very intent and their policy all indicates that they will be looking ultimately right into the embodied carbon in the materials that, that come through into that building. Leslie, did you want to add a talk, anything to that? This, this, this concept of embodied carbon and why it's important within the, the grander picture? So when we're speaking about the embodied carbon, we're looking at essentially more of like a cradle to grave approach of one particular product saying when you're looking at your bricks you're not just looking at where do you purchase those bricks but you're actually looking at the energy that's been involved from the extraction of the materials used in that bricks the manufacturing the transportation um, right up until even the construction of the building the ongoing maintenance and then disposal of those materials so you're looking at the whole not just the life cycle of the product but from beginning to end. So once you start looking at that, you start to see what building materials actually have a high embodied um, energy, and you start looking at alternative building products that will result um, in less uh, carbon being used um, and energy as well. But uh, I think it's quite important for us to stress that this is quite something that we eventually have to start um, looking and tackling because uh, because of that. Um, and so we need to be educating people on how 
to select materials and that materials is not just about the cost but about how those are extracted and manufactured and then transported and, and used and finally disposed. My final question to each of you, to the four cities on the call, the call is to say, are you, are you ready? Your confidence levels, each of you are confident in the, in the ambition. Are you ready as a city? How do you think things are going to, to pan out? And let's start with uh, Nondemiso. What's your thinking, Nondemiso? Are you ready there by Etiquini to finish the job? Yes, we are. We're very ready. And I think what gives us the, the, the confidence to know that we're ready is that even from the onset of, of, of when we started the, the program, we went to all the different line departments, which then are on board with us. Uh, so from your BCOs to your building inspectors, everyone is on board and everyone is asking, how can we make it better? How can we ensure that it's a success? So we are definitely ready and everyone is excited and we're just waiting to just hit the ground running. From City of Tone, we are more than ready. We are really looking forward to the implementation, as I said previously um, in, my, in my discussion. Where we are currently, so we are working towards public participation. So we'll be going for uh, public participation in in the second quarter of, of, of the year and looking to finalize the, the, the policy and the bylaw. And also just to, as I also reiterated previously, that uh, is also making sure that we incorporate as, as, as many uh, input as possible uh, for this bylaw implementation. Yeah, from City of Twain's side, uh, we, we are definitely ready, Pete, and we're looking forward to more engagements and making sure that, you know, at, by the end of this program, when C40 says we've done, we've, we've assisted you as, as, as much as we can, then we are able to just, you know, move and run with this process. And uh, I must say thank you also to the Sustainable Energy Africa for the amazing job that they've been able to do to make sure that cities are, you know, understand all these terminologies also, and we are able to, to, to you know, uh, communicate effectively to, to the public and to our stakeholders in terms of uh, taking the message out and for people to buy in as they have been buying in since we started this pro uh, process. City of Joburg, I may be uh, frowned upon by my colleagues, but I'm going to say it in the Joburg way. We will do it, <laughs> ready or not. But I think the point is this, we are really in it as a team and I am immensely motivated by the other three cities and their participation and their willingness to share as much as the other partners in support of CL, C40 in general. But ultimately it is up to us and we run a huge institution and I think we should not underestimate the transformation and capacitation that's required in our own in internal spaces. We're pushing the boundaries on things like renewable energy and how to incorporate good practice into um, simple things like approvals. We're doing working on the ease of doing business program with the World Bank. And those things are important to make policy initiative like this work. I am truly trying to say we are committed as a city. And like most Joburg things, the gold rush will happen. So we better start putting up those tents because people are going to live somewhere. And I think from a Cape Town perspective, we are in the process, we're crossing our T's and dotting our I's and we working closely with other departments to really integrate this net zero carbon policy work into other policies that are ongoing in the city. We must say there are a number of hurdles around the legal role of cities um, and also the monitoring that we currently are working on to make sure that we address those um, in a manner that everybody within the city um, is happy with. The city of Cape Town recognizes that buildings are a key priority climate change mitigation action area. And so we're really working hard to mainstream this idea of net zero carbon buildings. And we actually build in capacity within the city by creating positions to enable us to, you know, to facilitate 
and promote low carbon infrastructure provision within the city. It's been a great program to be involved in, but now the, the, the work now begins within the city in mainstreaming this and making sure that the policy is embedded and is absorbed in the city and all our buildings actually start complying with the policy and the regulations. So I'm looking forward to this next, the next chapter of implementation. If we want to find out more about this project, um, Hlengi, could you tell us uh, where we could go? If anyone is interested in the program, they can visit our City Energy website. It's called www.cityenergy.org.za. Uh, there you'll find all the documents that have that we have uh, we have put together uh, around the, the evidence base that we have uh, we, we have gathered uh, since the project started. Um, we also available on LinkedIn and Twitter, and all of all the programs will be, will be shared there. Uh, lastly, we, we are putting together a website that will be specifically dealing with net zero carbon buildings going into the future. So, uh, if and, and the policies that all the cities are putting together, the build, uh, the website is currently underway. And it will be called Smart Buildings website. It will be out soon, hopefully uh, by end of February. You know, we heard from the cities now, this isn't just a technical change. This is really a change about systems. It's a change about people's behavior. And we're hoping that Web Hub will become a site of active engagement by people. And that site will also direct people to the city's websites. And of course, people can go there immediately. And the cities, you know, it, it shouldn't be much of a hunt. And they've got quite a lot of resources on um, resource efficient building, but also on their policies where they have been put out for public comment. Those, those would be available there. So in the second episode, we're going to be going more into the governance structures, both from a national, provincial, local authorities, how they can make change uh, through their governance approaches. So for the time being, to Liana, to Leslie, to Nondemiso and Kedebone as the representatives from their respective cities, we wish you the very best. And to the team from Sustainable Energy Africa, to Megan and Tlengiwe, all the very best colleagues. And Amal, always great having you on board. Thanks for your participation today. Enjoy the rest of your evening, colleagues. Speak to you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Amal. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Talking Transformation podcast. Please engage with us and let us know your thoughts on this episode. You can do so via the Anchor podcast platform. There's a voice message function available via the app. You can also follow us on Twitter via Talking Transfo and the number one. So Talking Transfo one. Our theme music is kindly made available by Tribal Need. Find out about the music, the street art shows here in Cape Town and Europe via tribalneed.com.